Welcome to Healing America with Dr. Jim White. Jim has been investing, coaching executives, and turning around companies for over 30 years. Now your host, Dr. Jim White. Hello, this is Jim White, and thanks for tuning in to celebrate the lunch of Broken America, the 10 guiding principles to restore America. I am often asked why I wrote the book, why I wrote the book, uh, Broken America. I find that question extremely interesting because I answer it many different ways. So this evening, uh, I'm, I'm just going to share uh, is, is straight up is the, I, I wrote Broken America to present the case that our country is deeply fractured. And in my opinion, far off course. For you that uh, tune in every week, you know I have, a, I have a tendency of repeating myself and to make an emphasis. And so I will certainly not deviate from that for this evening. The world is, in my opinion, again, laughing at the dysfunction and the backward that of backwards America, and has stopped seeing our country as a beacon of democracy and the land of the free and the home of the brave. In my opinion, what has transpired in the past several years in political rhetoric and behavior is not okay and certainly not sustainable. The ship needs to be steered in the right direction in order for the country to be able to regain its stature as a true world leader. Our politicians must represent all of us in order for the United States of America to once again become unified. And I don't know about you, but uh, just before we went live, I had CNN on in the background and seeing all the news and uh, uh it, it is absolutely, uh, absolutely a fact that we are not united and we are fractured. Broken America is a call to action for all Americans to put political party aside and find common ground to unite all Americans under our country's founding principles. America's founding fathers disagreed about many significant things, the abolition of slavery, the banking systems, and the limits of government power. But no matter whether or not they were federalists, all colonial politicians agreed on one thing, a unified free nation not beholden to any foreign power. What would our founding fathers have thought of our nation's status today, in which every issue is divided between party lines, basic facts are disputed, and winning the next election is more important than what is best for the nation as a whole. What would they have thought about foreign meddling in our elections? Broken America, the 10 guiding principles to restore America demands that, demands, I chose to use that word, demands that, in order to create a safe and prosperous future for all citizens, we must look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves if this is the country our founding fathers and mothers intended or what we want to pass down to our descendants. Is this what our founding fathers and mothers intended or is this what we want to pass down to our descendants? I want to thank former Secretary of Defense and Director of CIA Leon Panetta for his support of the book in which he wrote, this is a book for all Americans who cares about the future of our country. Thank you, Secretary Panetta. I also want to thank Professor Robert Shapiro for his early support. Professor Shapiro is with us today. Professor Shapiro is former chair of the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, and he served as acting director of Columbia's Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy during 2008, 2009, another challenging period in our history. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He received a Distinguished Columbia Faculty Award in 2012, and in 2010, the Outstanding Achievement Award of the New York Chapter of the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Professor Shapiro specializes in American politics with research, that's, that's very for research, 
and teaching interest and public opinion, policy making, political leadership, the mass media, and application of statistical methods. He has taught at Columbia since 1982 after receiving his degree and serving as a study director at the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Professor Shapiro has authored and co-authored several books and numerous articles in major academic journals. Professor Shapiro, what a resume. Welcome to you, sir. Welcome this afternoon as we launch Broken America. Uh, th thank, you very, thank you very much, and thank you for a very kind introduction. I want to say it's very happy. To, I'm very happy to meet you, and I want to congratulate you on your on your book. Thank you, sir. Thank you. As I said, you were one of our earlier supporters, and uh, we thank you for that. And uh, uh, and, and preparing for the uh, the launch this evening, uh, your work in Columbia is 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 most impressive. So, if if I may, I just want to jump in, um, just jump in, and just just have a discussion. The current political landscape, as you know, is divisive and lack of dialogue. In your opinion, where is the country headed if we remain this way? Well, it's question to start off, right? that is, it. where are we headed if we remain as divisive as we are? In well, your opinion, where are we going? Well, in, ter in, ter in, ter in terms of talking about divisiveness in, in American history, we're in a very divisive period. My frame of reference in terms of worst case scenarios, ob obviously, is the, uh, the, the Civil War period. That is, uh, the degree of partisan conflict along liberal conservative lines and, and along civility, incivility lines is, 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 is really so off the charts that uh, this, this is very worrisome. And it's, and it's going to come to a head in the in, uh, upcoming election. And, and, and in that spirit, you know, that, that's, that's why your book and a lot of other work being done by different organizations trying to figure out how do we get out of this you know, partisan, partisan mess? How do we break the cycle? That kind of thinking and work is, 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 is very important. You know, as I was writing the book, uh, Professor, uh, I always ask the question, what do I have to say that hasn't been said over and over and over? And I'm sure with all the work that you do and your research and you're trying to present material. And uh, one thing that I, I, I really wanted this book to be was not uh, not slanting one way. I, I just just believe that we had to be right down the center, but at the same time, we have to call it the way we see it, the best we know it, the best we see it. And uh, I, I had a couple of discussions earlier today in some interviews, and where one of the interviewers was saying, uh, seemed like to me it slanted to one party. And I said, no, I, I don't really care what the party is or who the person is that's at the head. And uh, in, in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, we'd be saying the same thing. So uh, my premise of restoring civility, the word civility and patriotism by returning to the values of the Constitution. And I know you've done a lot of work in that area. As you read the book uh, where I uh, started the foundation and uh, the Constitution, uh, the 10 principles, uh, you think these 10 principles uh, has a chance of getting traction as we go forward? Well, th th this is a, this is a very good question, and I, I just want to situate your book in, in the context of current approaches to how to deal with the, the current problems. Now, a, a lot of work's being done. Political scientists have uh, um, engaged in a lot of hair pulling. Philosophers have, have have done the same. And just for example, the National um, Academy of Arts and Sciences recently issued a report called um, it's called Democratic Citizenship for the common purpose. And these, um, these task forces have come together and, and have tried to make recommendations to tra change the rules and structure of American politics in ways that could moderate and, and American politics and make things much more conciliatory. That is, they're trying to deal with the problem by kind of changing the rules and figuring if they can change the rules for elections, require voting, um, engage in campaign finance laws, um, Mand things like mandatory voting, required national service, those kinds of structural changes. I think that's all well and good. Uh, political scientists have studied cer certain kinds of things, but they really haven't. There, there's no evidence yet that any of those things have had an effect, but uh, some of the big ideas haven't been, been tried yet. The alternative theory about this approach to this is, is to basically say, 
wake up America, wake up political leaders. The, you know, we have these guiding principles. I mean, you, you, you've come up with 12, others have come up with, a, you know, with, 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 with different ones or the same ones configured different ways. Right. And they've, they've stressed the importance of political leadership. And, and in talking about your book, when I blurred the book, I used the word agency. That is, we're talking about leaders engaging directly to try to deal with the problem, recognizing the problem, and come to grips with it and engage with each other. Now, now the problem with that, of course, is that in the current climate of partisan conflict, leaders don't want to want to do this. And I've, I've done my own research, and we can talk about changing the behavior of leaders, which you've, you've stressed, and also changing citizens, I think, or changing the rules, and then my, and then, and then the fallback is, and uh, I need to be careful how I say this, um, is change, changing the people. And by changing the people, I mean things like generational replacement, Agreed. immigrants coming to the United States, new people, not just the people themselves, but the leaders that emerge from those groups, the next generation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to throw in the power and, and pass, pass the baton or whatever to the next generation. But, but where your book fits in is that your book is reminding, hopefully, the next generation of the important principles to wrestle with. And so, you know, I, I, think, I don't know if you thought about your contribution in that way. I think you're kind of yelling at the current leaders and current people. But I'm saying, moving forward, we, we may have to uh, turn to other people, just the new generation of leaders and voters. I absolutely agree with that, uh, Professor Shiro. And there's one thing that I was uh, thinking about. I have, I have two sons, which I'm very proud of, and one's 30, one's 27. Uh, my 30-year-old, uh, actually ran for his first political office when he was 18. Uh, my 27-year-old works in the state of California. I'm very proud of both of them. And they are very much involved in our political, uh, political environment. And they are some of my inspiration. And I ran a lot of the ideas by them because you're absolutely, we've got to get new leadership uh, coming forward. And, uh, and that's one thing that I was hopeful to do and uh, I don't think a father could get a bigger compliment from a son when he says, thank you for writing the book, Dad, because it will, it will hold a place and it will help us with some guiding direction going forward. So as, as you were sharing that, I was uh, getting some goosebumps, if I could say, because I absolutely believe it. Uh, I, I'm going to be 72 years old just in, in a couple of weeks. And I say I'm 72 going on 28. And uh, <laughs> in this environment, and uh, another, a lot of people will say, why is a businessman all of a sudden that you think you wanted to jump in and start writing about the political books or broken America? Well, I said, as a business person or as any person, I don't think we can sit on the sideline because after all, uh, we own this country. The people work for us. And uh, in, any message that we can uh, uh, share with all the 300 plus million people that has a right, stand up and be counted. And if we don't, we're sitting on the sideline and we this behavior that is being so, it's so, it's so, what, I mean, we're, it's, it's, uh, it's just vile in a lot of cases. It's, 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 it's so bad. So some of the current events that's just occurring. Uh, and uh, and, and if, I, if I can, I'm gonna fast forward to November the 3rd. What, in your opinion, would occur if uh, with all the rhetoric that has been shared now to suggest that the election could be uh, illegitimate or if, if one party doesn't leave and what happens and if we challenge that? We're going to see 2000, 2000 again? Where, and how do we reconcile, say, if the... Uh, if, if we're close on the uh, uh, close on the uh, popular vote and the electoral college, and, and somebody says, "Hey, no, it's a little gentleman. I'm not leaving." What do we do? Well, uh, well, the, the first the first thing is that the upcoming election, um, as you describe it, would be two, the 2000 election on steroids, so to speak. Now there are two aspects of it. There, there's there's one there's one aspect of it is um, 
if the can if the candidate who wins is, is one who wins the electoral vote and not the popular vote, that'll raise one issue of illegitimacy related to the electoral college being undemocratic. Now, of course, we're a country of laws and the rule of law, and the rule of law says the electoral college result is the one that's operative. And so, if 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 if, if, the, if we have a free and fair election and one candidate wins the electoral vote, that's that's the rule of law, and think you know, that would have to be changed constitutionally or through. All, every state passing legislation that would give the winner of the popular vote in the state, uh, uh, that would give the electoral votes of, this, of, this, of, this, of the state to the winner, the winner of the popular vote. There's, a, there's legislation that's been proposed. But, but the, the current issue that they reflect on legitimacy is simply the counting of the vote itself and the act of voting itself. And the one big difference between 2000 that I remind people of is in 2000, Florida and the hanging chads caught everybody off guard. In the current election, you know what's coming. The post office knows what's coming. The postal workers know. The state officials who run the elections know. And the state officials, for the, mo for the most part, running elections are people who want to do their job and get, a, get an accurate count of the vote. These aren't, these aren't politicos. These are, these, are, these are state public servants. They're trying to do a good job. And the people know, the voters know, that there's that concern. And they, should, they need to take greater care in how they, in how they vote, whether it's by mail or whether, whether it's in person. I think, there's, I think my own view is I think people should have a greater incentive, if they can, to vote in person. Um, and I, th I think that would that would be a help, but but that that is you know that's an issue here. And things could go. I mean, no, and just through a process of learning and preparing, it's very possible that the votes might get counted much more quickly than expected. And I think in the I think the best situation would be if the day after the election we had a uh, a winner based on the votes cast on election day and the um, at the paper ballots that were sent open quickly. Um, but of course, it doesn't. You know, we don't know. It doesn't look. It doesn't look like that right now. The rhetoric is very high with all kinds of conspiracy theories. I wish the conspir conspirator conspiracy theory thinkers on both sides would just cool it and uh, and wait for the vote to occur. I absolutely agree. And we're we're not short of the uh, conspiracy theories. There was a uh, uh, re recent. Uh, article that I read and I think the national security was what is the greatest threat to the United States today and uh, and uh, this is where sometimes I get myself in trouble uh, and, 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 and I was not surprised to hear the term it was white supremacy so we have we've gone so far left uh, and so, so so far off track I should say and when 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 we think about we are our biggest enemy, that concerns me. Your thought? Uh, I think I think that's when you, when you ask the question. You know, obviously, obviously, people are, are conjuring up image, images of, of the Russians interfering with the election, and so and so forth. Well, obviously, one current threat is the um, you know is is the coronavirus. There's a health problem here that we've got to get under control. Your your book talks you know talks talks about uh, economic the. the um, Capitalism and money, and obviously, you know, the one consensus today among even conservative economists is we've got to get the health problem under control before we can deal with with the, with the economy. But I think, but but you know, but in response, in thinking further about your question, it, it's it's the the biggest threat is basically us are the biggest threat, so to speak, in terms of you know, our behavior in the context of the of, of the current election, uh, and 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 the election potentially has a way of you know stabilizing things if we can if we can show ourselves and the world that we can have a free and fair election even in the face of everything that we've been going through that would be the that's the current challenge yeah about the media boy when, when, and when i do that we could probably have a 10 or 12 hour not a week discussion uh and uh i'm i'm, I'm so thankful and so blessed that, that to be able to uh, come together with bright people such as yourself and, and, and do these webinars and I often said, uh, again, what do I got to offer that's not being spewed on CNN, NBC and Fox and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I know you do a lot of work in the media. So w what's your thought? How is the media helping or not helping the current uh, devices? Well, the, 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 the current, the media environment, I mean, doesn't help to the extent that the incentives that the media have in terms of covering things are to, are to basically emphasize conflict 
with those conflict cells and then the media are businesses. They're, try, they're out there trying to attract audiences. And basically the, the liberal media and the conservative media have their niche off of niche audiences, as we say, and they're trying to appeal to them. And so the, the conflict that we currently have doesn't come from the media. It comes from political leaders. And with the media cover them, and they're going to cover them in a way that emphasizes the conflict. And by virtue of the way they cover it, they amplify the conflict and make it much more difficult to lessen the conflict. And so now, of course, of, of course, here in terms of how to deal with the problem, if the leaders cooled their rhetoric and cooled the conflict, the media would be, would, you know, would, would be forced to, to report what the leaders on both sides are saying. And if they moderated, the, the media coverage would moderate as well, even though they might have incentives to inflame it. And the inflammation is occurring on the left and on the right in the media. Yeah. You know, um, I, I agree with that. And uh, there's another thing that I was thinking about, and I was doing some media research, and I was looking at the campuses. And you mentioned COVID-19 is one of our uh, biggest threats as well. And, and also I talked about the book, and, and, you, and you talked about it, about we first got to get the COVID-19 under control, but the economy itself uh, under the current president, I mean, we're going to have trillions of dollars of debt. That we got to dig out of this hole once we get this COVID-19 under control. So for students are going back to school and uh, you've been an educator for years and years and years. Is there any sense of the students right now, uh, their feeling of the current uh, political environment? Is it uh, any, any any current feeling or is it all online or uh, what, what's going on in the campuses or is uh, the, the feeling as you know it? Well, um, it's a little bit hard to detect because the, the students have been, they were they were told to go away in March and, and not right. come back. And they haven't all been in, invited back. Uh, at Columbia, we haven't invited our undergraduates back. Everybody is 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 is, is online. What we what we do what, what we do know is that the younger generation has you know tends tends to be a little bit more disenchanted with different aspects of current politics. They do tend to be disproportionately um, liberal and Democrats on on a lot of a lot of issues. That that tells you something about the nature of generational replacement, of course. But but their but their difference differences based on you know race and ethnicity among um, among um, among those those groups. I think the I think um, uh, I think young people are very impor important in this in this process of generational replacement that, I, that I've talked about um, as, as well. They're very important in the in the current election in the sense that they tend to be the group that that's least likely to vote. So to the extent that voter turnout increases among that group, they can have a bigger effect on the election. And of course, here it depends on where they where they live and whether they're turning out to vote in, in the uh, in the states. With regard to college campuses, they're 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 quite they're, they're they they're, they'll be quiescent in the sense that everybody will be not permitted to gather in big groups, um, you know, on, on campus. Uh, what we saw in in in, um, in in the recent months is that young people were out there protesting. Um, Current problems in, in, in politics, and, you know, and, and on both sides, both supporters of the president and and and, and, and opponents in different contexts. Um, so so it's, it's hard it's hard to get a, a full sense because in, in normally we get a sense because we'd see everybody on campus and everything would be a buzz, but that, but we don't have that now. Uh, the campuses are much more sedate because people are um, following the, the social distancing rules, et cetera, required by the current situation. Mm -hmm. With the time we have remaining, uh, may I ask what 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 projects are you working on now? In, in the articles, uh, if you may just uh, share some of the work that, well, uh, uh, that you're involved in currently. Well, the, some of the work I've been involved in has actually been tracing the nature of partisan conflicts exactly. we have in the United States, and you know, and um, basically, Republicans and Democrats have become more divided on all issues: domestic issues, foreign policy issues, defense issues the environment, energy, just about everything. And it, and it wasn't like that, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, 50 years ago. And some of my work is, has tracked that. Uh, one thing I'm examining is, is to what extent is that divide occurring because it's the Republicans becoming more conservative faster than the Democrats are becoming liberal. And what I found is that it's basically both parties moving in opposite directions. So that, that is, there's this kind of symmetry to, to this. It's in terms of look, pointing your fingers, fingers at it, what's, what's, associated with the divisiveness, it's, 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 it's both sides. It used to be the case that the Republicans were, based on data, were, were the ones least likely to want to compromise. The Democrats have started to catch up on that. Both sides are, are kind of digging, digging their, their, their heels in. 
So that's one, one aspect of the work I've been um, uh, looking at. The other aspect that has to do with this population replacement, to what extent this conflict, ideological conflict has been occurring among all age groups. Is it the case that the, the youngest age group is less conflictual? And there's some evidence that, that that's the case. Uh, also, to what extent different racial groups, whether uh, African-Americans and Latinos, Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. among those groups are as divided as whites, less so there. So if, if the pop population transforms and you know, further in, in the direction of the, the white population being less, that, that could have some kind of moderating effect. But those, those are small differences, and, the, and those, those consequences would take uh, you know, a very long time to come about. And then the other work I've been, I've been uh, working on has to do with uh, basically about facts and lying, in, lying, lies in American politics. And I, uh, in, in my work, in my work, and without getting into the partisan aspects of this, I, I draw a distinction right. between lies, big lies, and little lies. I actually have another frame, frame, you know, phrase for them, but I won't use it here. Um, the, the little lies are things like lying about things like crowd sizes. Big lies have to occur occur in the context of lying about things that that potentially have an existential effect on the United States. So misinformation about interference in elections, uh, government, government officials from the uh, from intelligence agencies not being willing to testify in front of Congress. Those, those kinds of things reflect possible deception on major issues. Those kinds of things bother me. The, the kinds of, you know, fact checking that we see on lots of little things that, that accumulate to a lot doesn't bother me so much. It's, it's, it's on the major issues where I worry. I, 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 I tell you, and uh, in my opinion, <laughs> Yeah, lying and everything is based on trust, and that's what I've been uh, uh, running my businesses. And uh, I am a, uh, a a combat veteran during the Vietnam era, and uh, it's all founded in integrity and trust. And uh, I've tried to live that for over forty years, and uh, it just bothers me when uh, our politicians go to the camera, look in the eye, and you know they're telling you a lie, and and it seems to have. I mean, it seems not affect them. It's okay. And in my concern about what's that doing to the five-year-old or six-year-old or eight-year-old, what message are we sending and what message are we sending if we're sitting on the sidelines and we've got to explain to our adolescents that, oh, what the senior leader or politician said is not necessarily true or do we say to our, our, our kids, what they're saying is a lie. So I, I, I think there's a whole cultural issue that we're that we're going to be experiencing in years to come based on the current uh, environment from people lying, at the, especially uh, from the highest land of office. Yeah, and 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 that and that that's occurring in a context where this younger generation. I mean, look at look at what they're experiencing. I mean, they, they one generation experienced the financial crisis in 2008. And that, and, and uh, there was a generation that experienced, you know, 9/11, um, uh, right after, before that as well. And you know, think now of the current ge generation, the class of 2020, in all the uh, in all the high schools and colleges that didn't have their graduations. Being in the class of 2020 has has a certain kind of significance. Living through through this pandemic is 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 a crisis on the on the order of the Great Depression and World War II. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Professor Spiro, I would love to set up another time uh, after your election. I'd like to dig more into your research. Uh, if you'd be open to coming back and uh, maybe we can a lot more time to have a deeper discussion, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, so how can people, if they wanted to reach out to you, if you're open to that, would you like to share uh, how people might be able to contact you if you, if you would uh, wish to, to receive contact or people ask questions of your work? Sure. Um, email is the, is, is, is the best way. I, re, I respond to all emails. You can look it up on the Columbia, you can Google me and find it on the website. But, but the, the email address is the letters R, as in Robert, Y as in Yale, S as in Shapiro, 3 at Columbia.edu. So it's RYS3 at Columbia.edu. Look it up if you'd like. Okay. And we'll make sure that we post it on the website as well. And sure. uh, I certainly hope I didn't put you on the spot answering that question because I think your work's fast, fascinating. And the more that we can get the 
young people to get involved in what you're doing. Uh, and I, for one, thank you, sir. I really appreciate uh, your early support and continued support. And anything we can do to support you, please reach out and we'll be happy to do it. So thank you. And uh, I am, I got a couple of minutes left. And uh, uh, for all of your, all, all, all of our viewers, we have uh, a great launch going on, uh, uh, brokenamerican.com. And if you go to the uh, uh, website and you happen to see and you look on it, it says, hey, the book's going to be one to two months out. Uh, <laughs> that means that's, that's probably a good thing, but it's not going to work out. We're working on that. We've got a lot of momentum and uh, a lot of momentum. And for uh, our team, we'll be reaching out to those uh, people that have the uh, 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 sign up for the Kindle version of Broken America. And once again, the website is brokenamerica.com. And next week, uh, we're going to have uh, another guest. Uh, and this uh, Joe Walsh is his name. He prefers to be called Joe Walsh. And he's a former former congressman and, uh, and, and a presidential uh, candidate. So he will be with us next week. So thank you for all of your support. Thank you for what you do. And we'll talk to you the next week. Have a good evening. Thank you for your participation and interest in Healing America with Dr. Jim White. To stay in touch with Jim, go to www.healingamericawithdrjimwhite.com.